Hello, welcome back to this series on upgrading PostgreSQL database clusters, major version upgrades we're talking about here, but we will briefly talk about minor upgrades as well. In the first part, we just looked at some kind of supporting information about making updates to production systems in a safe manner with the smallest amount of downtime that we can manage. And in this video, we're just gonna talk through what it means in Postgres, how we can do it, the different options we have for, for making an upgrade and which one's the best. And that will then line us up nicely for part three, the third video in the series, which will be just doing that as a, a demonstration. So I already included a slide like this in the first video. I'll include it again here with some slightly different stuff. So I'm Luke Briner, I'm the head of technology at Smart Survey, and I've been in the software development industry for a long time mainly in the kind of Windowsy world, but probably the last, I guess, five, 10 years got really into Linux and more recently PostgreSQL, containers, Kubernetes, that kind of thing as well. So lots of fun stuff. And I recently ported SQL Server databases to PostgreSQL. So I learned quite a lot about the differences between the two in that process. But I then also went on to set up a production cluster with replication across a number of virtual machines in Azure. And then on top of that, set up PostgreSQL monitoring and automation. So I've done quite a few of different things around Postgres. I've already made some videos about setting up clustering using Barman and Rep Manager to set up backups and replicas. So that's quite fun. Go and dig those up if you want. But in this one, we're very specifically looking at the upgrade process. And if we remember this from the previous video, if you saw it, we're going from version 14 to version 15 of a PostgreSQL cluster. The fact it has replicas is not really relevant. It doesn't really affect the way that you do the upgrade, but just for a bit of completeness, I've included those as well. And we want to do this major version upgrade in the least risky and ideally lowest downtime method. And although it's theoretically possible to upgrade and skip major versions, you could go from version 14 straight to version 16. I always kind of think that if you do that, you're asking for a little bit more trouble because you've obviously got that many more changes to be considering. Therefore, you're more likely to have a problem. If you instead plan to do this as automatically as you can, as regularly as you can, you say, right, I'm just going to run this once a year and go up one major version and then keeping the risk low and um, keeping it much more manageable. So when you look at the PostgreSQL uh, support policy, you can see here they're basically saying, yeah, we release a new version, a new major version with new features roughly once a year, which is pretty impressive, really. If you think of SQL Server, it tends to be three or four years maybe between uh, major versions. So that's pretty impressive that they do it every year. And you can see also they say they support a major version for five years after its initial release. And then after that five year anniversary, they say you get one last release with any last fixes and then it's end of life and it's not gonna be supported. So we need to be kind of thinking in terms of, right, well, if this is the case, if we're running a Postgres cluster and if this is our production systems and our business depends on it, how are we going to you know keep this in the back of our mind and not just leave something for five years suddenly realize it's out of support and like we said in the first video then getting forced into performing an upgrade that we might not necessarily particularly want to do but we we have to do it because all of a sudden we're not going to get any support and that might mean of course in the case of a production system there might be a bug that comes out in something, maybe a security bug that's not going to get fixed because you're running version 10 and version 20 has already been released. So we need to kind of wire this into our mindset of saying, right, well, what are we going to do here? And like I say, this to me means every year I'm going to consider upgrading to the next major version um, from the one that I'm on. So 13 to 14, 14, 15, 15, 16, and so on. And, you know, we need to look at then when and whether we should upgrade. So in a sense, I've kind of already said we should always be upgrading anyway because you don't want to end up with something out of support. And the kind of community feeling 
is that you should always upgrade minor releases. They won't contain changes to the data file structure, which is important. So you don't have to worry about, you know, screwing up your cluster files in the process. Usually it's going to be just fixes to the executables to the server itself. And most of these you will get automatically if you're on a distro, Debian, Ubuntu, um, I'm sure Red Hat and the others are similar. They, these will come through the package management system anyway. So if you're doing regular dist upgrades, which hopefully you are, then you're going to be getting these minor releases anyway. So that's kind of fine. We're not really worried too much about that. Um, now, one of the recommendations I saw about major versions, so minor releases would be 15.2 to 15.3 or 15.4, etc. A major version will be 15. something to 16. something. And one person said, you know what, wait till at least you're on major version.2 before updating a major release. So some of us get quite excited and they go, oh, they're releasing version 16. Oh, it's so exciting. I need to be on version 16 today. And we, we upgrade on day one. And of course, we're exposing ourselves potentially to security or performance bugs that are going to be in there that none of the testers noticed beforehand, which is fine. We don't always notice these bugs. And they're going to go out into the wild. You're going to notice the bugs. You're going to be reporting them. Hopefully, they're going to get fixed. You're going to be upgrading. And you get to avoid all of that, at least in production, by saying, you know what? I'm just going to wait a couple of minor releases for them to sweep up maybe some of the more obvious bugs, and then I'll upgrade. So wait till we get to 16.2 before we upgrade to version 16. And that second minor version was released within two months of the first version. So you're not waiting a long time for that, but that's just a recommendation. And yeah, like with all things, try not to fall too far behind. The further you are behind, the more risk there is in upgrading because, you know, you're not just potentially upgrading the database version. You might might be upgrading your OS and other things at the same time as well. And if you're kind of going, well, I'm not going to, you know, upgrade Ubuntu 10 to be running, you know, Postgres 16. So then the jump in OS version can also bring with it its own challenges. So trying to do small changes more regularly is always um, a safe, safer sort of approach. And when it comes to things like new features, again, you kind of think, well, for the most part, if I'm happy with version 15, then I probably don't really need a new feature, right? Because if I did need it, then I wouldn't be running version 15. I'd be running something else. But obviously, every now and then something comes along, you might say, well, it might just be a performance feature, like the performance has improved on index building or something. But for example, version 15 comes out with the merge statement and you might go, oh, thank goodness. Up until now, we had to do this horrible SQL to support merge. But now it's a first class element of the language. It's going to make our lives easier. So it's a new feature in one sense, and we might want to upgrade for that. But in general, you know, try and keep up. Like I say, if you plan to upgrade a major version um, every year, and as long as you're on perhaps the one of the most recent two or three versions of Postgres, you're you know you're probably fine for the time being. But don't let them get five years old. So the next question: Can we upgrade? Because you know, in, in most cases, we think of upgrades as adding new features. But of course, it's very much the a fact of life that every now and then things get deprecated and they get removed. You see it a lot in Kubernetes, in fact, where every release, it might just be moving things out of beta and into the main namespace, which means that the functionality is still there, but your existing scripts aren't going to work anymore. So it's not necessarily going to break anything on deployment, but it might mean the next time you try and deploy, things are not going to happen. But we need to be aware that it's necessary that these things change. So when we look at the release notes, we go, oh, my goodness me, there's 30 different things here that are listed in the release notes. At the same time, we should be thinking, great, let's you know invest an hour of my time looking down these things. OK, new features, probably not going to be a reason not to upgrade. Whether or not I want to use Merge, if it's there, it's not going to break anything that I'm using already. But other things might be interesting to note, like selective publication of tables with logical replication. So instead of logically replicating a whole table, I could potentially replicate a subset. So that might be useful for kind of data warehousing type things. So even though I don't need to use that right now, that's a cool thing just to kind of file away somewhere and go, ah, it's interesting to know that. I'm going to maybe write that down somewhere. So when I come back to this, I can remind myself that that feature exists in version 15. But the most important bit is the bit down the bottom. I have cut it off because it's really long. And it says it contains a number of changes. Look at the language that may affect compatibility 
with previous releases and the reason that they say may is sometimes it depends exactly how you use something as to whether the change is going to break it or not so there's one example there remove public creation permission on the public schema and then it just says the new default blah 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 now for you you might not use public schemas and um, you might not really know what it means and you know you're going to have to spend some time and read up on it and find out well, what is that is that relevant to me is it going to break what i've got or is it only going to affect the way i create things in the future uh, and again that might just be something to pass on to somebody else and say the dba team for example say oh by the way guys in the future you're going to have to do this this way instead but it's not necessarily relevant to the upgrade but other things will be and they might say oh i use this very niche feature in postgres that no one else uses uh, but it's really important to us because of what we do and they're getting rid of it they're renaming it they're changing it in some way so you do have to read down those of course um, and look down and go yeah not relevant not relevant not relevant not relevant and occasionally you might even have to you know go onto the news groups and, and ask them and say i don't quite understand what it means now there is a feature in pg upgrade which we'll talk about in a minute it's one of the command line tools which can check the source uh, data files and see whether they're compatible with the version that you're moving to so if you're going from 14 to 15 it can say whether you're going to have any breaking changes in the process now the problem with pg upgrade is it doesn't appear like you can run it over the network and although you can run multiple versions of postgres on the same server it can get a little bit messy so i wouldn't say it's necessarily very easy to do this the easiest way if you did want to run that extra check would be my opinion would be run a replica up so you get all of the data files replicated and then disconnect that replica from the cluster turn that replica into a primary node and then you can go through the process of installing a new version of, of postgres and run pg upgrade to see whether there are any problems it doesn't look like there's an easier way which is unfortunate i tried earlier to point it across ssh to another server but it kind of got confused and it complained about different things so most of the the time i think you're going to have to read through it and understand the changes or perform a um a pg dump all of the the database schemas and look through the sql that they generate and say right am i using any of these keywords that are affected so that's another way but when it actually comes to upgrade options generally we have kind of four things the first one really is about minor upgrades so like i mentioned earlier you just update using the package repos or wherever else you get your updates from and then you just restart the server now obviously there's a potential little bit of downtime there if you're going to restart but you know obviously you're gonna to have to take the hit at some point usually what i do is i wait till late in the evening when the traffic's really really low i fail over to the main replica and then i can reboot the primary as well as updating i can reboot it to get all of the os updates as well and then i fail back so i tend to use the primary always as the primary the reason is just because of some of the apps that we have don't properly support multiple servers in their connection strings so it's it's better for me to always use that one but yeah failover reboot restart that's dead easy the other three options are pg dump all which is a command line tool pg upgrade which is also a command line tool and logical replication which is one we're going to look at in a bit more detail but pg dump all is a command line tool and effectively effectively it creates a logical backup of the databases on the server so just like you'd kind of expect in a normal backup you you make a backup which you can restore onto another server but importantly it's a logical backup that means it's a backup made from uh, an abstract level of data not just the raw physical contents of the data file and that's because that will change between different versions of postgres so you can't just physically lift up a row and give it to a newer version because that will look at it and go i don't understand that format that's not how i store rows so instead you create something that's maybe more akin to a sql statement um, or a, a sql description of a table or something and that's what gets put into your um, backup file and of course it's easier for a newer version to restore something like create table blah because that's going to make sense whatever version of um, postgres or any sql server that you're running 
So the physical backup is useful for replication. That's usually how we do replicas in a cluster because it's quicker and more compact. But when it comes to major versions, if we're going to use DOM pool, we're going to have to create a logical um, backup and restore that onto the secondary. Now, unfortunately, this will involve stopping the primary because we need that, those files to be in a, uh, in a consistent state for the backup to be successful. And that's probably something that's kind of obviously unavoidable, right? You can't be trying to take a backup while stuff's changing and get deleted and added and, and whatever. So that's going to take a certain amount of time. And again, this is something you can test depending on the size of your database. You could test this beforehand by literally just copying that whole data directory to a replica or setting up a replica and then disconnecting it and running dump or so well, how long does it take? Is it going to take 30 seconds or is it going to take 30 minutes? Because that might dictate for you whether this is even an option or not. And the other issue that you have is if you're um, if you then turn your primary back on again after you've taken the backup, if your application is still getting traffic, then that traffic is going to make updates that aren't going to be in the backup. So you would then have to plan, well, how do we get those other updates into the new instance after we've restored the backup? So that starts getting a bit icky, right? It's a bit like saying, well, I've, I've kind of got most mostly up to date. So now I've got a, a, an almost up to date new version and I've got a more up to date old version and somehow I'm going to have to synchronize those. And of course, the downtime itself is significant. And, uh, you know, like I say, it could be um, tens of minutes if it's a big enough database. So not really great. But one of the things I don't like about these types of um, upgrade scenarios when you're using something like a backup is you can take that hit, you can have your system down, let's say you take it down for an hour um, with planned maintenance and all your customers are annoyed but they, they put up with it. You could do it all and it, if it doesn't work at the end of it, then you end up saying to everyone, yeah, sorry, I turned it off for an hour but it still doesn't work. So we're gonna have to turn it off for another hour next week and try again. So it's, it's one of those things that's a little bit iffy. It's not really um, reducing your risk particularly of something going wrong. So don't really like it and I don't really like the amount of time it takes now one of the things that it is potentially good for like I say is you know just taking a, a quick dirty backup of the existing database to then run tests on um, you like I say you can do that with a replica if that's easier just create a new replica and then stop replicating to it so you can then treat it as a standalone database you could try in place upgrades you can try backups you can try all kinds of stuff um, but generally speaking it's not much good I don't think for most people's major version upgrades um, so PG upgrade is another command line tool but this is slightly different so instead of effectively going via a backup which is potentially really quite slow with PG upgrade you can do a couple of different variations of the same job but the general idea is you upgrade the files that are already there and upgrade them from say version 14 to version 15 now clearly you're going to have to stop the database to do that because it's going to be using those files but the various options that you have are one you could create copies of those files uh, that's going to take longer but you're going to end up then being able to turn the primary back on and it can use its own files again you can create two different sorts of links as well uh, depending on the file system so um, i think they're effectively the equivalent between soft and hard links the soft links kind of quicker because you're effectively just creating links instead of genuine files but of course you're sharing the old files between the two different database systems so although it, it works and it's supported it would mean that if something went wrong you potentially have already broken your data files and you won't be able to go back to the old one without restoring a backup or copying the uh, you know a backup of the old files uh, back into the old database server now there is maybe a scenario where you might want to do this and the only scenario i could really think of is you might have a ginormous server that costs you like five thousand pounds a month or something well whether you hire it or you bought it and it's not always an option to go and spend five thousand pounds on another server to run it up alongside to do a nice blue green and de-risk it and everything else you might just not have that kind of money and you might think look uh, uh, you know i know it would be better to do it blue green but actually the in place is much more affordable for us in which case we'll take the downtime we'll take the 
you know lack of availability and maybe it might take an hour or two hours or three hours but we're happy to do that uh, maybe two o'clock in the morning once a year and just do it in place upgrade so you can do that and you can run multiple versions of postgres on the same server but it is really risky there's risk of port conflicts and the knock-on effects with things like firewall rules connection strings and those sorts of things but also you know can you guarantee that you're not going to end up upgrading an old you know executable with a new one because they happen to use the same directory by accident or you know you accidentally pointed one of them to the wrong directory and it's just blatted everything in the old database so running things side by side on the same server although it's doable and it might save you a bit of money um, it's also very risky so you've got to be that much more careful with it so when it comes into logical replication this is effectively what i'm going to be demoing in video three we're looking at one of two types of replication that postgres supports which are physical and logical and we've already mentioned this physical replication is effectively the replication of the data file itself or a portion of that data file because it's the raw data it's obviously super fast because you can think of say a database row with four ints in it for example well that might only be you know i don't know what that'd be eight bytes 16 bytes or something a very small amount of data to replicate that whole row but imagine if instead of sending the row you're sending a sql statement that says insert into table this in this in this in that statement itself you know could be 10 times bigger than your original 16 bytes so there's an overhead in using logical replication but of course the nice thing about it is all of the versions understand the insert statement not all versions are going to understand the same type of data representation so although we use physical replication usually with replicas because it's really fast and efficient we use logical replication when we want to copy things to um, a newer version or potentially an older version as well doesn't always work um so uh, i think we've yeah this means we we can use logical replication to upgrade to a new version and we can, can also keep the old and new databases completely in sync which is important so rather than creating that potential lag that we can get if we take a backup and then the prime we start the primary back up again because we're kind of trying to keep our availability up we start creating more and more lag between the old and the new database with the logical replication because it is a replication as soon as those changes are coming into the old database are automatically getting copied so that lag isn't there or certainly not to the same degree there's always potentially some small amount of lag but it's you know milliseconds or you know maybe a couple of tens or hundreds of milliseconds not minutes or hours or whatever else so by using logical replication we can keep those things in sync when we're ready to switch over we can then stop the logical replication which wouldn't be needed anymore now that all traffic's going to the new database and then at some point we can simply remove the old cluster in its entirety now one thing to consider is data retention in backups if you have a backup from an older version it's going to be a backup mainly based depending on what your um, while wow level is we'll look at that when we look at the um, uh, postgres itself uh, if you've not got that set to logical then the data in the logs is only going to be physical which means that you can't take that back up and restore it directly on to your newer version so let's say you've got a load of version 14 backups you've then upgraded to version 15 and then you go oh oh no i need that data from that backup from two weeks ago you're not going to be able to restore it because you're going to go no, i don't understand that format i'm version 15 and that's version 14. now obviously you've got options there you could spin up a version 14 vm just to uh, you know restore the database and get the data out and that might be fine you might just have to accept that once you've got the new one up and running you're going to start taking backups on there maybe you're going to run it for a week um, in replication just so you've got a, a number of backups and then at the point you switch over you might say i'm just going to now delete all of the old backups because they're, they're just taking up space now so you need to think about that what it means for your business you might have a requirement to keep that data you might not but again you just need to have a think about it and decide what you want to do so this is what it kind of looks like with logical replication um, so this is the old cluster here we've got a primary we've got two replicas 
and we used physical replication for the replicas like we mentioned because it's nice and efficient and compact and super fast uh, the lag i usually get is you know less than a millisecond it takes to send that data so that's pretty amazing um, and then we build our version 15 cluster alongside and we build it exact pretty much exactly the same as version 14 I'm not going to talk through well how do I get version 15 and all the rest of it depending on what distro you're using it might be pinned to a version so Ubuntu 2204 is pinned to version 14 so to install version 15 you have to add additional repos but then that's going to upgrade everything including your version 14 um, cluster so um, you generally don't want to do that um, within a given distro so you might be installing a new os you might say right i'm going to install uh, ubuntu 2404 not out just yet um, and maybe that will be pinned to version 15. so i'm not really going to talk about that but the long and short of it is you're going to set up effectively an identical um, cluster with whatever replicas you want you might want the same number of replicas you might say I'm just going to start with one or two and then once I've changed over and I've destroyed some of the old ones maybe I'll create more replicas so I don't end up with about 50 replicas that are costing me loads of money but ideally here just to mention it again we want to use automation to ensure the consistency of this so I have an Ansible script that can create me uh, a Postgres primary server and also a Postgres secondary. There's not much difference between the two of them. Um, obviously, the, the config's slightly different on the replica. Uh, and, and I pretty much have to create the VM, um, add an SSH key to it, and then run the Ansible script, and it, it just works. It's amazing. It installs all of the Postgres stuff, sets it all up, and starts it running. And this is super important because it's all those little changes um that you can make in production and again we do it sometimes you go oh we just need to increase the number of replication slots let's increase it from 10 to 20 and you don't really want to run ansible because you're scared it's going to break something so you just go into all of the config files and you change it manually which is fine but of course if you don't remember to go and update ansible then the next time you deploy a new one you're getting one with 10 slots rather than 20 slots so what i like to do and i did it this time is i created my new primary I then downloaded a copy of postgresql.conf from the version 15 and I downloaded my you know custom one from version 14 and I compared the two and I said right are these changes my changes that I have put in both places are they my changes that I forgot to put in the new one because I didn't put it into Ansible or is this a change between version 14 and version 15 that's just in the um, platform version in the package version and there are some of those and you need to look at it and go right is that is that something i remember changing before or is it you know you read the comment usually it will say oh, in version 15 we changed this to default to something different or whatever so you need to look at those and again just take some time don't we don't need to rush it because our version 14 one is running taking all the traffic and doing everything so it's all good that manual check i know sometimes you kind of think oh it's boring i don't want to check it let's just you know connect to it and see if it works but there's lots of things that appear to work that are not working properly um, things like um, the cache memory and stuff that postgres uses all configurable and it's something we had set up in version 14 whereas by default the package maintainers have really low amounts of cache um, of, of ram used for cache so you almost certainly need to change this anyway um, so that's why i did deploy a fresh version of version 15. Um, one thing i also had to do was i deployed a version 15 one standalone just from ubuntu's repositories not from ansible so that i could see what the platform version of that file looked like uh, again it's going to have new stuff in it all the rest of it i needed to make sure that what ansible was going to deploy which was based on version 14 was suitably updated so it also worked in version 15. Um, so there's a few little steps there but it's not rocket science it's just kind of thinking right once i run this and it overwrites that file is it going to have the right stuff in there how am i going to know how am i going to check it and you know in my opinion this is the the best way to to set up new machines logical replication um we will set up for each database and just this idea of duplicating the virtual machines if something goes really wrong here I can just tear all three of these down They're these in, in smart server they run in azure so it costs me nothing just destroy it completely 
and then start up three completely new ones and start again if, if it gets that bad if it's not that bad I, I might try and you know fix them but ideally i want a fresh install to know that my um, scripts are all working so any kind of conflicts any kind of mess anything um, i can do here now i can also then test this which is also really important with this going to be on different ip addresses but the same port number and everything else i can connect from my local machine using the app using you know postman or something pointing to whatever and i can just make sure that the the software works does the does my driver software work with version 15 um can it insert an update is there some weird change that's happened in postgres that i didn't spot that means it's not working so all of those tests i can do while the old system here is just sitting away in the background doing its job and then with the new vm set up alongside we set up that logical replication and although it's only shown as one arrow here the logical replication is actually per database so we can migrate and test one at a time and, and again it's just super useful way of de-risking it so i had seven microservice databases to migrate over and of course i just picked the one it was a small database it's hardly used or that microservice is hardly used and it's just really low risk i set up the logical replication copied it across that just gave me the you know the basics yeah okay so the process is correct i'm dumping the schema correctly um, i can check the data did the data get copied across by replication can i connect to it is it all happy and then i can actually move that one microservice over to point to the new system before all the other databases are, are even replicated yet so that's the nice thing about it. You don't have to, when you use blue green, you get to blue green on every single database, not on the whole thing. It's not all or nothing. And then I had problems with Grafana. Um, and I think I probably caused those problems, but it was all going a bit wrong. But again, I've got the old copy, I just deleted the new one off the new cluster, you know, delete all the replicas. And I just started again, took the schema again, added it in, set up replication again, did it all again and it was fine so i'm sure that it was something that i did wrong but because it's one database at a time it's really really low risk um set it up test it and then switch it back if it doesn't work and then i had the new cluster running for uh, maybe a week in parallel with the old one before i fully switched it over that was partly because there was a weekend in the middle and partly be because of the problems i had with grafana which i think happened at the end of the week and then i went and sorted them out at the start of the next week so maybe roughly a week and I probably cost no more than a hundred pounds so it's kind of pennies in the scheme of what the business is spending but that hundred pounds bought me this super low risk super low downtime way of changing things over now there are some limitations to logical replication that you need to be aware of if you're using postgres in quite a simple way which we are then most of these are not that relevant to us or they're not a big deal the first one is that the schema is not replicated you have to do this yourself so we'll see that later in the next video using pg dump to get the schema we do that we copy it over we import it into the new database uh, so that's easy enough to do but if you do have a system where people are using migrations to make updates to databases then you will need to plan how you're going to freeze those migrations while this takes place because if you apply a schema change to the source database it won't replicate across and if it's a breaking change then the replication will stop working it won't take the database down but the replication will stop working so you'll start getting that lag and you'll need to obviously fix it so um, that's one limitation um, the second most significant one is about sequence numbers so if you have these these are the auto increment numbers you have in some tables for row ids and that kind of stuff the numbers themselves i'm not sure if there's a kind of a, a proper reason or or what but they don't get replicated automatically which do means they need reseeding which again we'll look at later on when we see us um, in a demo to make sure that you don't get a conflict because if you don't reseed them and they're all defaulted to one next time that new database tries to insert a row it will fail because it will say i've already got a row with number one in it um so and then it'll fail and it'll keep failing so um, you reseed those to be a higher number than the number that's already in the old one so that they don't conflict with each other um truncate isn't replicated um most people probably don't use that as a regular part of their um, database system 
um, mostly we would use that if we're doing stuff manually but again that doesn't get replicated again I don't know why but um, just worth knowing that um, and if you are using it then you again need to freeze its use during that period of changeover um, large objects not replicated again I don't use those not not an issue for me um, and tables only you're actually migrating tables not views or foreign tables now views are obviously a bit funny in Postgres because they can sort of act a bit like a table because you can update a view like you can in SQL Server as well even though it's a view of existing tables um, but you still can't replicate that view you replicate the underlying table the view would have been copied in the schema copy um, and yeah so that might not be weird to you but for some people that might be important um, there's a whole thing about partitions I'm not going to talk about we don't use partitions but the long and short of it is they basically need to match between the old and new database service which again you probably do by default um, but there might be a scenario where you think oh let's get rid of the partitions because we don't need them you will need to get rid of them before you do the replication otherwise it looks for those partitions it won't find them and it will fail and the last one which isn't really a limitation but there's obviously a potential performance hit on really big tables if you've got a database that's maybe hundreds of gigs in size and maybe one of those tables is 150 gig then that initial replication when the subscription gets created is going to copy that table um, in its entirety after which it will start replicating changes now you can imagine 150 you know gigabyte sort of hit on the the network or whatever in real time might be pretty massive so there are options to reduce the number of tables that you set up a publication for which can reduce this but unfortunately the minimum at the minute the minimum size is one table so at some point you're still gonna have to take the hit but you might decide that you want to do that out of hours where you're not going to kill your main application in the process so this is the last slide really um, about this before we actually look at doing it for real so the approach here it kind of goes without saying really plan think understand that it doesn't take forever to plan an upgrade to Postgres but if you haven't really thought about it or planned it considered the risks considered what the company's approach is to it uh, do you have a boss does that boss need to know what you're doing and what your approach is going to be or the rest of it do you need other people to help you are they going to be on standby where are your backups all that kind of stuff um, some of that you might just know off the top of your head and it might not be a problem um, one of the companies that I read an article about this same topic said that you know they had a number of people working on it for a number of weeks to plan it all and consider this that and the other it probably took me a day um, to plan it for us because our databases are smaller and simpler um, and they're not the main databases that are used for our application so it was much less risky for us but also I understood everything about the way they were set up because I set them up so it was obviously easier for me to plan that but really kind of thinking about each step of the process and saying right what happens at that point is that a breaking change uh, am I gonna have to take a hit there is that something that needs the ability to fail back or is that just something I can do asynchronously in parallel with um, the, the main job we then need to enable logical logs on the old primary so in order for though that database the databases to replicate to your new primary it will need to use a logical uh, log format and that will require a restart and that is not the default log level because logical logs take up more space so you need to consider that if you're tight on disk space you might need a plan because um, again I'm not sure I don't think it's a massive amount but I would estimate that probably um, the logs are double the size uh, bearing in mind it's only the logs that are created from when you enable this all of the old logs don't sort of increase in size so if your traffic is fairly low while you're doing this you're unlikely to have a big problem and of course eventually you'll delete the old cluster and they'll all get deleted anyway uh, but we'll need to do that then we'll set up a new cluster alongside the old one I won't go through that piece by piece I've already set that up because that's not the main topic we're looking at um, including replicas we can set all of those up in parallel again the nice thing about blue green is I don't need to touch the old one particularly apart from that step two until I do that and then steps four and five creating a schema for the database on the new cluster and setting up that replication I can either do that like 
for each database. I could do one database. I could change over the application to use the, that database. And then I could go back and do database two, or I could just do that for all of my databases in one go. There's not really a lot of difference between them, depending on how you work you, uh, and whether you're automating it. It might just make more sense to do them all in one go, or you might prefer to have a process where you can work through from beginning to end for one whole database and application first, maybe to de-risk it, maybe just to make sure that um, everything's gonna work correctly. And then once you've set up your logical replication, you're now in a state where you've got two largely identical databases. Of course, the new one isn't writable yet and you shouldn't write to it because there's still data being replicated against it. But you can test some things against the new cluster. You can obviously test reading it. You could test things like a delete and stuff like that. But if you do test any destructive operations, you'll then need to, um, you know, delete the whole database and create a new one, start again and replicate it again from scratch, which is fine. You can do that if you want. Um, and then the important bit, the, the ickiest step, really resetting sequences on the new cluster. Um, and then I say immediately, but not, not necessarily, you know, immediately, immediately. But soon after you've reset those sequences, you need to be in a position to switch over because even if you leave, depending on how much of a gap you leave between the old sequence and new sequence, that old um, sequence is going to be catching up slowly as more traffic's coming in. And eventually, if you take too long, they'll conflict again and you'll have a problem in the new, new database. Again, that's fine in as much as you could reset them again um, at a later date if you wanted to, as long as you're not writing to the new database, um, you won't have a problem. But in general, if you can reset the sequences when you're ready to do the switchover, and then the switchover could be for you uh, a load balancer change. It could be deploying applications, which is what I did with, with different connection strings in. And the nice thing with that is, like I say, one app at a time, if there was a problem, which there only was with Grafana, the others all worked fine. But if there was, it probably takes two or three seconds to actually revert that uh, microservice back to an old version and pointing to the old database. Uh, but again, the more you can test that in advance, the less likely you're gonna have any um, you know, shock horror on the way back. Um, and then, yeah, eventually after that, you delete all of the old stuff. But in the next video, we will be looking at doing this um, you know, actually demoing this bit by bit. Surprisingly, there's not as much in there as you might think there would be because, like I say, a lot of the stuff is the planning and things like automating the new cluster setup and all the rest of it. I've already done all of that, so we're in a position now where we're ready to do the bits where we're actually going to start touching the two database clusters and starting to make the changes that are going to enable us to switch over really quickly. So hopefully see you in the next video. If you've got any comments about the content of this video, then please put them below.